Of course, the laser is now 50 years old, and we're all familiar with some of the everyday applications of the laser. But this kind of research, um, this extreme light um, research, has taken, into, it, taken us into uh, completely new territories. And Professor Muru will tell us about that. Um, but along with the basic scientific advances which we hope this will make and is making, we hope that this will also have a spin-off in relation to new technologies, particularly in the area of medical applications, because it's possible to direct this energy uh, through a single hole into a single cell. And therefore, you have tremendous um, potential to moderate the behavior of aberrant cells in the human body, and that opens up a tremendous um, new field of, of activity and inquiry. Um, Gérard Moreau is the director at the Institut de Lumière Extreme uh, at the École Nationale uh, Supérieure de Technique Avancée, and uh, one of his most um, important uh, recent applications and, and uh, developments is the so-called chirped pulse amplification, which he has discovered, which is a way of applying these pulses um, at very high power. So today, we've had all day almost um, a very entertaining, um, vigorous uh, meeting uh, between French and Scottish scientists in this field of high energy um, high light energy physics. Uh, I think from what I've heard uh, this evening that that went extremely well and many of the people who took part in that uh, meeting are here. I thank you for taking part in it. These um, Franco-Scottish meetings, which we hope will continue, this is the second in a series of three for this year, um, are extremely important to us. And I think I detect from both sides that we would like these things to continue and perhaps expand into new fields of inquiry. But very important to get young people involved in these uh, meetings and these exchanges. Many of the people in this audience will be familiar with uh, lectures at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. If you're not familiar, we are a very broad-based um, um, academy. We are Scotland's national academy, and that means that we cover all fields of inquiry not just science, not just engineering, medicine, um, business, the law, and arts and humanities. The whole spectrum is, uh, is uh, represented, which is one of the things that makes being president um, an extremely exciting uh, experience. So we're very pleased that such a good audience has, um, has come, and uh, we hope you enjoy uh, this evening's talk. So I'm going to ask now Professor Muru to give his talk, and after that, uh, Professor Wilson Sibbett and Professor Muru will sit down and answer questions uh, for about 20 minutes. So, Professor Muru, it's over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for these uh, kind introductions. Thank you very much to, for this invitation also to be in this august place, you know, this National Academy of uh, Edinburgh, this Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, it's, it's also for me, my, my wife, Marcel, sitting here, uh, the first time that we are in this city. And I tell you, we really fell in love already with, uh, with Edinburgh. And uh, it's a great place. I mean, that's... Uh, Fantastic city. Okay, so uh, also, uh, I would like really to, to thank, uh, I have a number of friends here. Maybe the most prominent is, of course, Wilson Sibet. With Wilson, we have been together for about 40 years. Right, Wilson? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's amazing, you know. Uh, Wilson, of course, is... Uh, I have to say that he's a fantastic uh, scientist and a fantastic human being, too. He's a good golfer, but this, this time I just I will have my hand off on this one. Uh, it's, it's a great human being, and um, I remember a fantastic experimentalist. I remember when uh, uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson's advisor was 
Dan Bradley. Dan Bradley was a fantastic also uh, personage. You know, he was really someone, uh, uh, he was a great man, very active, and so on. And fortunately, you know, he had, uh, he had, um, was it, was it 1982? 1982 when he had a stroke? In 1982, he had his strokes and he couldn't talk anymore. That was devastating, of course. I mean, it was devastating certainly for Dan, but also for us. And, but I remember when uh, at one talk, this, at one talk, um, Dan was describing a very, very difficult experiment and so on. You know, it was maybe a one street camera and things like this. Um, and he was, you know, how do you do this, Dan? You know, how do you, well, it's easy. Uh, if you have Wilson Sibet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember Wilson. Okay, anyway, and of course Wilson has been discovered, the discoverer of his uh, Gerland small blocking. Okay. Anyway, uh, but we are going to use that, and we are using it. Oh, by the way, also, I'd like to thank all the, the young people who came and gave this great talk this, uh, this afternoon, okay? It was great. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is really uh, extreme light. Light with uh, extreme power. Light that you can focus over an extremely small spot and produce extreme, light, extreme intensities. And we see that, especially with uh, friends like uh, Toshi Dajima, but also Dino, here, yeah? where I have to say a few words about Dino in a few, in few minutes. But we see that this extreme light has maybe a new way, a new paradigm to do fundamental physics. And this is what I want to discuss. So, in fact, my talk, I could have called it as a study of structures of matter from quartz to vacuum. The reason is I'm, I'm talking about quartz is because 50 years ago, it was a, it, uh, it was a discovery of nonlinear optics. And I will talk about that, and that was done in quartz. But now, uh, 50 years later, we may want to do the same thing in vacuum in nothingness. So 50 years ago, as, as uh, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, that, was a dis that was really the first demonstration of, a f uh, of the lasers. And, it's a very, uh, and we had a very nice event in, at the Louvre when uh, Wilson came, you know, and, uh, uh, and wished to celebrate this event. So that was May 16th, 1960, first, first shot, first laser shot was fired you know, in use uh, labs, laboratories. That, and, uh, and now it's interesting to see what happened. So when the first, the first laser emitted at one wavelength, it was one shot, a minute or something. Uh, and, um, and you see that it was one EV photons. Uh, and the laser progressed in two ways. One way was to use a laser, to use a photon of laser, to slow down atoms, to slow down matters. And that led to the field of cold atoms. And now the characteristic of energy of these atoms now uh, are measured in femto EV, you know, nano, between nano EV, femto EV. Very, very quiet, very, very low temperature. And, uh, and that led to this really also very, very nice field of, um, of um, cold atom physics. Now, the other way is to take the same photons and try to accelerate particles to very high energy, to very high velocity. In fact, velocity was changing the speed of light. Particles will be accelerated now with light to relativistic velocity, okay? And this is a field of relativistic optics. Now, you see between femto-EV and now we are the GEV, 
and we think that you know in in few years we'll be at the TEV regime and even we think we have schemes about PEV you the two extremes you know with one EV photons covered 30 orders of magnitudes this is this is really very what i call ubiquity you know for something uh, so now as i mentioned you know it was a uh, it's a 50 years. I mean, the reason why we are in this in, we are at this point now is because of this nonlinear optical effect that we're using. Okay, so we have to say a few words. So 50 years ago, uh, these gentlemen, top row, you know, were uh, demonstrated nonlinear effect. You know, that was Peter Franken. This one was Gabby von Rasch. This we had Peters, and then we had Alan Hill. Funny story here is, of course, all these three guys were professors, right, at the University of Michigan, good university, okay, at the uh, <coughs> physics department. And this guy here, Alan Hill, was a summer student. I thought well, I had to introduce Alan, you know, and uh, and uh, and I thought he was. Uh, PhD, he became after that a PhD student of Peter Franken, but he was hired by Peter for the summer just to do uh, some labs. Uh, Peter thought that he was very bright and so on. He said, why don't you come to the lab? You know, you can stay with us for, for, the, for the summer. So he started to work in, in June. And June 29th, he had, he had shown the, the, the paper that everybody knows, you know, in our optics, you know, is based on his work. He was, he showed it in, in three weeks. This undergraduate student, this summer student, showed, showed this, uh, uh, the, showed the, um, uh, the, the harmonic generations in, 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 in quartz. So that's, it's quite fascinating. He's still, still a fascinating guy. Now, uh, of course, here we have Nico Bloombergen, you know, who really codified the field, right? And uh, got the Nobel Prize. Okay, uh, so anyway, so uh, now laser until now has been extremely good, basically, to study atoms. And, but now, as I said, uh, we, what we'd like to do is to use it, you know, to study the, stru the structures of vacuum, okay? <laughs> So why do we have to, why we're interested by vacuum? Well, because the vacuum, you know, really defines the structures and properties of the law of physics and defines the value of the fundamental constant. So this is, and also, it is the mother of all particles. We are all coming from vacuum. And, uh, <clears throat> but in order to, <clears throat> To study the vacuum structures, you have only one thing to do: is to turn, you know, the virtual particles, which are in fact forming the vacuum, into real particles. And in order to do that, you have to use big machines. You recognize, of course, this one. But, I mean, these machines, they are basically all based on, 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 on particles, means uh, particles with mass and charges. Here, of course, you have G.J. Thompson. And, uh, and this is where, I mean, all the discoveries, you know, in fundamental physics were made, you know, in the 20th centuries by using these particles, mass and so on. Uh, <clears throat> particle with mass and charges. Now, for the, the way we see it, there may be a chance, okay, to change the paradigms. It's not quite done yet, okay? We are just starting. Okay. And uh, is really trying to do fundamental physics now with, with uh, massless and chargeless particle, which mean photons. Uh, and uh, so we formed what we call ISEST, which is International Zeta Watt Exa Watt Science and Technology, because what I say is a big proposition, it's very challenging, okay? 
So it's, it's not just a matter of one country or one lab or something. I think, you know, we have to gang up, you know, uh, behind this idea. And I'm very pleased to have one of the pillars of this idea is here, you know, you know, and we are, in fact, tomorrow going to sign an MOU, a staff <coughs> guide, uh, trying to really uh, bring together, I mean, trying to formalize, to formalize uh, our activity, our collaborations, you know, uh, between French and, 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 and Scotland uh, with, with by signing this MOU. So, so <coughs> anyway, so, uh, now, as I said, why we need a, a, a large-scale lasers? Well, we need a large-scale lasers because a large-scale laser could provide us with very large field. Uh, a large-scale laser also, and I will show you that, okay, could produce very, very short pulses. I'm going to show you that there is relations between power intensity and pulse duration, but not maybe in the way you think about it. And also, you need a very large laser to produce high energy particles and radiations. And you will see that if you, this comes naturally all together. This is what's, what's so nice about nonlinear optics, okay? You jack up the intensity and bing, you are changing, you are producing shorter pulses, producing uh, higher energy particles, high energy radiations. Okay, this is my curve which describes intensities as a function of years, so you will understand better. When, when Mehman demonstrated this laser, and when Peter Franken showed uh, harmonic generation, was in 1961. And the intensities, or I mean the, the power, were really measured in kilowatts. Intensity 10 to the 8 watt or so per square centimeter. But that was enough, really, to produce, to produce a non-ear effect. Not much, 10 minus 9, 10 minus 10, okay? But nevertheless, it was shown. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, of course, uh, as we introduce new techniques to, to boost up the, the, in, the power and so on, Q-switching, mod locking, and so on, you know, the intensity uh, came, I mean, increased. And then we had this, uh, the intensity was in fact so, so high that the, the laser components, you know, couldn't really take it anymore. The, you will really, you will uh, produce what we call nonlinear effect. And that clamped the intensity to that level. About. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> and in, with, uh, um, with my, st uh, my student, uh, um, Donna Strickland, we came up with this technique which is being used, and we have been, it's been mentioned a number of times, CPA. Share post amplification, I will show you how we do it. Anyway, now what is, ex what, uh, so now what we are doing is we are climbing this curve. So we are somewhere like 10 to the 22 now, but we have uh, plans to go uh, into regimes which are in a, what we call 10 to the 25 or so what per square centimeter? This is a project uh, Eli, what we call extreme light infrastructures. Uh, I may say a few words about it. But really, where we want to go is even higher. Uh, I will I will go through this. Um, maybe I should do it now. Is um, you see uh, now basically everything we have heard this today this afternoon was basically bound electrons, okay, uh, non ear optics. Now, uh, with, uh, but Fabien also mentioned uh, the relativistic optics, when, you, when you, you go a little bit higher in intensities, 10 to the 18 or so, you are what we call in, in, in relativistic regime. 
And then we, uh, uh, when we go even higher, around 10 to the 24, a relativistic regime for the electrons, for the electrons, because the electrons, you know, move in the field of the lasers and becomes relativistic during one cycle of light. Now, when the laser uh, keeps going and goes above 10 to the 24, not only the electrons, but now the protons, the ions, become relativistic. And this is a regime, or a new regime, of course. But also, you can start to do something to the vacuum, start to polarize the vacuum, and so on. And, and we are expect, and, and, and also, you start to break down pairs. But I, I, will, I will talk to you about this later. OK, so anyway. Uh, but every, every, everything, everything we do, OK, I like to say our journey always starts with a care lens unlocking, you know, demonstrated by, by, uh, uh, by uh, Wilson's group in 1919, in 1991. I remember when he presented that the first time. It was quite, quite amazing. And uh, so this is, uh, this, I mean, uh, that's really uh, that's a huge contribution from, from Wilson. Uh, now, uh, and I nicely deserve, you know, this Royal Medal. medal. Now, of course, so in order to, uh, to, to produce this very high intensity very quickly, as I said, we take, uh, we take the laser from Wilson Sibet, and then we uh, very short burst, but we cannot amplify it straight like this because we are producing this nonlinear optics, so we have to stretch it. So we pass it into a stretching pair, uh, a system dispersive elements, which is going to stretch the pulse by almost a million times. So once the pulse is stretched by a million times, we'll be able to, to amplify it a million times better. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's what it is. And, and then uh, uh, this stretch pulse now is amplified. You really suck out all the energy from the amplifier. And then once the pulse is amplified, you recompress it back to its initial value. Now the amount of manipulations that we are doing is that's utterly amazing because here we stretch the pulse by a million times. Then we are going to amplify it by uh, 10 to the 12, a thousand times, a billion times. And then we, try, we do take the pulse and we put it back, you know, we compress it by a million times. And what you want to have, it's a perfect pulse. Okay, so it took us some time to, 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 to come to this point. But anyway, right now I think uh, the field is mature. We, we know almost uh, what we have to do. To... Anyway, so uh, now one thing is, which is exciting is, of course, I mentioned that already. Uh, in nonlinear optics, there is this kind of intensity pulse duration, virtuous, I would call Virtuous cycle. Yes, we know that to get high peak power, you must decrease the pulse duration. That's, that's corny, right? It's no, nothing. Now, the converse, it turns out that the converse is true. But in order to get short pulses, you must increase intensity. So, uh, and, 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 you know, we, um, with Toshi Tajima, like we call that this conjecture because it was not proven. It has been proven since. Okay, but when we wrote this paper, it was not proven. So we plotted from the very beginning times of the laser, the first laser lasers, you know, which were really, sh you know, kilo uh, uh, millijoules, sorry, uh, joules and um, tens of microseconds and so on. Until, uh, until the most modern laser and most modern compression techniques and so on. And also we added some simulations. There's really a, a, a linear relationship or inverse linear relationship, I should say, beca because between intensity and sparse durations. And, and so you can, you, can, you can see, you know, since the free-running laser, the Q-switching laser, die mod, mod locking uh, lasers, uh, um, KLM mod locking, uh, molecular modulation, I mean, all you name, you name it, okay? They are all, all there. 
And you can see that if you want to, to decrease the pulse duration, you, first, you must first uh, amplify the pulse. And this, of course, this, we heard this, uh, this afternoon, that in order to get these 100 centos out of second pulses, you first do post compression, post, post compression. That means you have first to increase the intensity first. Okay, so now, uh, one thing that we are using a lot, in fact, everything we are doing you know, in, in extreme light, is based on relativistic optics. It's based on the following, that uh, <coughs> the tenet, I mean, the, really, uh, is, is, is this. The force which is applied to the electrons, which is given by this Lorentz force, in, in classical optics, you know, uh, you say that F equals QE. But now, because of the intensity, this very large intensity now we are able to produce, this is not enough anymore. Because the velocity of electrons which move up and down in the field becomes close to the velocity of, of light. So you have to have to add this contribution from the magnetic field. It's nice to say E and B here in this place, you know, where, where Maxwell's were. <laughs> was from this town. Uh, but v, v cross B, okay, you have to have uh, this V cross B here. So the net result is the following. It's very easy to understand. And I think when you get that, I mean, you got ev almost everything, you know. Uh, you got the gist of what, what, what we do. So if you have the laser, you know, if you have really uh, low intensity, uh, normal light, okay, you know that it's a transverse electromagnetic field, and that was discovered by, by Maxwell, okay? Uh, and, and so the, the, the field is transverse to the propagation direction, the field of E and B is transverse. This is true until the velocity, uh, when V is very small compared to, to, uh, to, uh, to C, the velocity of light. When V is comparable to C, then things are changing. They're changing dramatically. Because, uh, because of a V over C, you know, you have, you have the V cross B, which is pushing the electrons along the propagation directions. So now the electrons, which are really, you know, bobbing in the laser field, now is going to be pushed, uh, pushed you know, in propagation directions. So this is completely <coughs> changed everything, okay? And, uh, and, and so, if you are now shining a laser, high intensity laser, you know, I, I, I admit, okay, into a plasma, and everything is plasma at this intensity I'm talking about, uh, then what happens is, you know, as I said, the electrons are pushed forward, and the ions are stayed behind. So what you are doing, really, you, are, you, are, uh, uh, um, you have a huge ch charge displacement leading to an uh, electrostatic uh, 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 field. So from this electromagnetic field, you are producing, which is moving at 10 to the 14 Earths, you are producing an electrostatic field, a DC field. You rectify, you rectify, you know, the, uh, the field, the laser field. Plus, he has a very good idea of this field, you know, to be, to go along the propagation directions. So you see this is, uh, is and, and also, the field can be of the order of the laser field. This electrostatic field can be of the order of electrostatic. So you have to remember these three things. But this is really fantastic uh, if you want to do electron accelerations. And uh, I'm not going to we talk about this. Uh, so this is for Serge Platard because he say, how, how do you do it? Well, you see, Serge, it's the way we do it. It's easy. You put, you focus your beam into a plasma and things happen naturally. You don't have to do anything else. 
course, you have to work on the laser. Okay, the laser is very difficult. <laughs> but after, as, after everything else is simple. <laughs> so you see, you are focusing the beam into your fall. You are pushing the electrons. The ion stays back. You are forming this electrostatic field, this electrostatic voyage with with uh, with the uh, the laser, and 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 that's it. Okay, you are accelerating your particles. And because the field of the laser is enormous, you can have, uh, you can produce field in um, 100 TV per meters. I mean, we heard, of course, Sylvia uh, told us, you know, that over one, I mean, in Dino's lab, over one centimeter, they have GEV. Huge. So, uh, and GEV uh, were first demonstrated by Lehmann's and all. So do you see that? It's in a palm, you know, that's a GEV. Now, if you see, look at the synchrotrons, you know, there are five GEVs, you know, they are huge. I mean, they are ki kilometers, you know. So you have factor thousand gain, roughly, even more. Now, uh, ca how can we now uh, apply this? Of course, people are thinking about colliders, okay? Uh, it's nice, okay, we could build colliders. Colliders now, you have to think about TV, of course, right? And, uh, and we say, well, I mean, instead of using, you know, uh, um, conventional technology, we could do lasers. By ganging up, you know, maybe um, uh, 100,000 of this GEV, I mean, you need to, for a TV, you need thousands. Uh, but also, what you can do is something else. You could, and this is a little bit, uh, uh, what's our, um, this instead of, because we understand that one thing, in order to really, to, uh, to make, to build a laser-based colliders, it's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of times, okay? Uh, but we could still do fundamental physics the way, basically the way it is right now, okay? And this is, in fact, this is, this gentleman here is uh, Director General Suzuki, uh, of K Director General KK. And he told us with Toshita Jima, you know, what you should, un what, sh what you should be doing is don't try to compete too much with us, you know? trying to do things that we cannot do, okay? For instance, if you could reproduce particles at the PEV level, okay? Even if it's a single shot, we don't care. Just produce just PEV, that would be fantastic. Even tense TV or so. That would be a great achievement. And uh, so, you know when you say, when you talk about PV, a PV with conventional technology, it w the accelerator will have to girdle the Earth. Okay? So, of course, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to be, we won't be able to do that uh, anytime soon with conventional technology. We have to think something else. But what's very exciting is that you could use some, maybe, some very large-scale laser. For instance, in France, we have what we call the megajoule, or we have petal, which is a fraction of a megajoule, with enormous amount of energy. As I said a minute ago, you know, this, for me, is a big reservoir of energy. You know? If we could repack this energy into a femtosecond. And, but anyway, we could really use maybe these this, this systems and try to do already fundamental physics without waiting 20 or 30 years, because that's the time it takes really to build, even with non-technology, uh, a TEV accelerator or something. So this is what we, uh, um, one thing that we are doing, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful, I say, to the CEA and uh, right now, Dan, because we are, is, we are planning to do that. This is, by the way, this is inside the megajoule system, okay? 
This is 45 meters. Is that the beam? Is that 45 meters? Yeah. Uh, this is about 45. So, you know, if you had a man, you know, wouldn't be. But anyway, so this we have, we can produce no? petawatt pulses with gobs of energy, 3 kilojoules. And these 3 kilojoules, if we focus these 3 kilojoules inside the capillaries with low, low, um, low density gas, over only tens of 30 meters, we, will, we could reach 100 GeVs. And, uh, and of course, I mean, we are very grateful to have people like Dino and so on to help us, you know, with, with in this endeavor because uh, it's, it's just, we, we are going to need everybody in the world, you know, to do that. And uh, anyway, uh, so what we do is we want really to, foc to focus this beam. This is 10 meters, by the way. This is 10 meters okay, into this this uh, this um, <coughs> this. Uh, Capillaries, but you don't see it, but you can guess it's here. And at the end of the capillary, we could get up to uh, 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 100 GeV. That's our dream. Of course, if you can produce 100 GeVs, then you can think about TV. But first, we have to be able to produce the 100 GeVs. And that's the inside of the chamber. We see the beam, you know, which is focused inside of the capillaries. The chamber, again, is about 10 meters. You know, it's as big as this room. Okay, so, and that, that is, uh, <clears throat> so, so I think, uh, because the laser is, I mean, we have a lot of place, and so, and, and we can think in terms of, 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 of now, TV, without waiting for, for, um, for the, you know, um, uh, 100 uh, uh, one TV colliders based on, on conventional, I mean, on, um, on on laser, but by using the fact that we have already the lasers available, which can really provide the energy. Of course, granted, it's going to be one shot, you know, a few shots a day, but we don't care. If we show that we have, we can produce energy. Now, what could you do with a few shots a day laser? Well, I mean, of course, there's a really... Uh, a lot of physics we can be done. TEV astrophysics could be done. You know, nonlinear effect in vacuum could be studied. You don't need you don't need a lot of uh, 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 reprate. Dark energy, dark matter. Lorentz invariance. Lorentz invariance. You heard a lot about the neutrino stories. You know that neutrino, which is supposedly going faster than the speed of light, but if you have really short burst of protons, but you can really make, you can make muons, and, and then the decays in, in neutrinos, and so on. Then you can, you can maybe much do the, all this measurement much more accurately. And uh, anyway, I mean, this is what I call, you know, metrology, precision metrology, and so on. Uh, of course, on the way, you can, re, you can do, uh, you can discover new things, new, uh, new, uh, new technology and so on. So, of course, I mean, as I said, you could really produce TV particles. You don't have to wait for them uh, from the sky, but uh, you can produce them. Um, and uh, it's very important, you know, if you want to study dark matters, if you want to study the origin of cosmic rays, how to, co you know, how cosmic accelerator works and so on, that could really help you. But this is just the beginning. You know? Uh, <clears throat> so, anyway, I'm just going to... Now, there's one thing is, as I said, if you have very high intensities, very, very likely you are going to be able to produce extremely short pulses. And, uh, uh, and if I'm going back to my curve, you know, Moore's uh, 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 my curve, you will see that at these uh, very high intensities, but we'll be able to produce this way, we should be able to produce zeptosecond and maybe yoctosecond pulses of very high energy radiations. So it's a new field which is opening up right now. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, and uh, this morning, um, this morning, this afternoon, Fabien 
Kere uh, mentioned, and also uh, Rodrigo uh, mentioned, uh, that if you have high intensities, you can produce high energy radiations by harmonic generations. You are shining the laser, high intensities on the, on the laser. What you do, you are going to move the critical you know, uh, surface, you know, at, at relativistic velocity. And this motion is going to translate into harmonic generations. And uh, uh, harmonic generation this way have been produced up to, I mean, the 30, uh, 3,200 orders, harmonic generations of order. This is quite, 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 a, quite, quite amazing. And they don't, have, they don't have really the ideal laser yet. They are using the Vulcan laser. Okay. So, but also, there is some, something very exciting, you know, and, uh, and also because if you can focus the beam over one wavelength, and if you can really compress the pulse over two, two a few cycles, you are, you are getting into what we call uh, the, the lambda cube regime. And Rodrigo mentioned about this regime. That what was, and this is a very exciting uh, regime. Is, this is really uh, Normova's at all um, uh, paper that I really recommend you to read. But basically what he says, he says the, f the following, but really if you're focusing the beam very tightly, okay, on the critical surface, yes, you are going to get this critical surface moving, you know, uh, uh, you know, back and forth like this, okay? But it's going to be more complex than this because the field, the electric field, moves like this. Okay, so you have this pressure like that, but you feel it. So in fact, it's going to be, a, it's going to have a complicated, uh, uh, the critical surface, you know, is going to adopt a, a funny shape. And so the light is going to be broadcasted, okay, in different directions. It's like a beacon, okay, or lighthouse, okay, effect. So it's going in this way. So. We have seen the lighthouse effect that was presented by Fabien, uh, but that's in completely different other regime and, and, and Rodrigo. But here is a lighthouse regime or beacon uh, regime uh, in, in um, at very, very high intensities. Okay. And you will be able to isolate these pulses because they are broadcasted, you know, in, 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 uh, um, along different directions. So if you have a very stable laser and so on, things that we can do, you know, of course, uh, CEP uh, stabilize and so on, then you should be able to do that. So that already shows, in fact, uh, we can show also, this is what we call a normalized you know, vector potential, one to 100, which basically is a field, laser field. And uh, if you see that, uh, you can produce pulses this way as you increase the intensities, which goes, uh, 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 which um, decreases as a function, exponentially, as a function of the, uh, the field. And uh, so we should get into the, really, the attosecond regime. But this time, of course, this attosecond regime, uh, I mean, should be efficient. Also, okay, and, uh, and and if we even go even further, we should really go in, hopefully into the uh, uh, the septo second regime. Very exciting. Now, also, what you can produce uh, uh, is <coughs> just um, tantamount to uh, to really the. Uh, the, the hard radiation, you can produce very short bursts of particles. Okay? These are, uh, if you are here, the laser is being shined on this target, and you can see this, this, uh, these tick marks, which are in fact, you know, these uh, electron bursts. 
and you see here the, uh, the, sh the radiation, short pulse of radiation. So, in a sense, what is very, and of course, if you have electrons and you're coming with, with, with laser backward, you can produce, well, Compton, in fact, you know, you can produce uh, gamma rays or X-rays and gamma rays and so on. And so what is so exciting now, okay, you can put all that together. If you have, you have, you are starting with few op a few optical cycle, yeah, okay, and then you can produce DC field, right? Enormous DC field. You can produce particles, very short bursts of particles. You can produce short bursts of radiations. And they are all synchronized. They are synchronized within a maybe a two second, will be maybe a two second precision. Okay? So we will see that's going to be very important later on. You know, this you know, reminds me that in the early days, you know, in the 60s, you know, when, when you had the laser and you are, produ you are producing Ramans, and then you are, uh, you are frequency doubling, and then you are taking the Ramans and frequency doubling, and you are mixing them, and you are producing, you started to produce, you know, uh, 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 you could do uh, exp really experiments, you know. Uh. So now, one thing I have to say, because we are talking about uh, fundamental physics, particle physics, and of course, uh, particle physics deals mostly with, with the vacuum. And, um, and here, of course, the vacuum, which is something which is mysterious since, you know, of course, antiquities. And, um, but um, uh, the vacuums, uh, here I'm showing, of course, all these people who have dealt with vacuums. There's, all, there's many more than that, of course, but uh, I don't have the time to spend too much time. So, but uh, the, I would say maybe the first guy who really dealt with the vacuum in a very serious way was Newton, because he discovered, you know, uh, the universal gravitation. And uh, he, he was, it must have been quite amazing. He was the first guy to realize that forces could be transmitted over a distance. Before Newton, all the forces, you know, were forced by contact. And now Newton came and said, wow, I mean, uh, there, is, there is a force, okay? But there's no contact. So what is carrying this force? So, you know, he came up with also the idea of we must have something, of ether and so on. So he found also necessary to, to introduce, you know, this, uh, this carrier, okay, the ether. And then we had this, this hero here. I'm very so pleased to be here. Uh, you know that Maxwell is not even in the guide, without a guide, you know, for the Edinburgh, for to meet Edinburgh. And it's not even mentioned, you know. Uh, you should really complain uh, to the... Um, about this, um, and but anyway, so Max, Maxwell's, you know, of course, uh, found that uh, he was absolutely sure that ether had to exist. Okay, so uh, so light could propagate, you know, uh, like a new family of uh, wave, and you know, just like air, you know, does for sound. We need ether. And it was amazing because also it found uh, um, it's uh, ether. He found that this ether must be as hard as a rock because he had to he had to explain why waves, electromagnetic waves, are transverse, are like that, and not like this, not longitudinal waves. And so he found, uh, so he found quite natural that uh, uh, light should be transverse. The, elect the uh, EM wave should be transverse light. It cannot be, it couldn't be, uh, because uh, the ether was so, so hard. Of course, and then we, we had Michelson and Morley experiments, 
which basically say that, I mean, the ether was started to be in questions. And it's finally, I mean, it's Einstein who really got rid of ether by saying that ether, who needs it? Okay, because we could explain everything, uh, special relativity, without ether. Except that, except that, in 1915, he had to reintroduce or about, with general relativity, he had to reintroduce ether. Because, and he said in one of his lectures, in Lawrence's lecture, he says that uh, according to the, uh, the theory of general relativity, space is endowed with physical quanti quality. In this sense, it must exist an ether. And according to the, uh, without ether, of course, nothing, I mean, will not be able to, light will not be able to propagate. Uh, uh, we will not have standards of space and time. We couldn't measure space and time, okay? But that was key, of course. But this ether, you know, may not be thought as endowed with quality characteristics of ponderable media, okay? As consisting of part that may be tracked through time. The idea of motion may not be applied to this ether. And, uh, and, and, so, and that was really uh, the beginning of what we call the quantum vacuum. So, uh, so, uh, so classically, uh, of course, uh, the vacuum, uh, I'm sure, I mean, we, this is, uh, we say that it was a public lecture, okay, so, so yeah, uh, so I'm going. Uh, so the classical uh, vacuums, you know, you assume that the classical vacuum is, is devoid of, of matter and also it's featureless, okay? Empty of anything. In fact, the vacuum, you know, is com composed of vertical, virtual particles and antiparticles and they are continuously created. So it's a very, the vacuum, in fact, is a very, is full of activity. And it is the lowest energy state. Uh, okay, so, uh, and this, of course, quantum vacuum is, you know, is, is being uh, seen with Casimir effect, with uh, uh, the, the, the lamp um, shift and so on. But what's exciting now is we have the possibility of to look at this quantum vacuum in, in a strong field regime, okay? And that is something which is uh, exciting with lasers. So that's why we try to do with, with vacuum what we did with quartz 50 years ago. And uh, in fact, <clears throat> you have these two gentlemen, Heisenberg and Euler, you know, uh, who, uh, 1936, you know, started uh, the vacuum under non, uh, look at nonlinear effect vacuums. And I'm not going to bore you with this, but basically what they say is the vacuum, the, the vacuum can be by, by, can be become birefringent. Can become birefringent. And so if you're sending, for example, an electric field like this, you know, the index of refractions, I mean, in this, in, in the directions, you know, parallel to the E field or perpendicular to the E field will be different. You will be in, able to induce a, a, a birefringence. And this birefringence, here, you have, you have, uh, uh, you have the, ex the expressions, U is basically the intensities, uh, and so you have n, n parallel and n pair, you know, here. Alpha is a fine structure constant. So this is very exciting because if when we do the experiment, when we do the experiment, and and we uh, we because these quantities are extremely, I mean, they are known extremely well. Well, okay, so 
if we observe any deviations from this, then we have to explain it. Uh, because they are exact. And, uh, well, I, I, I hate to show this because I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied with that. But anyway, so one of the possibilities could be because there is some, the, the vacuum is not exactly what we think, okay? And in fact, we have some dark matters or things like this. So, but what, what's exciting is I think because we, uh, we, we, we could have a nice way to, to, it would be, I mean, if we found exactly the expression which have been predicted by, by, by Euler and, and Eisenberg, and that would be okay. okay but um, we don't, you know, that would be exciting. Uh, <clears throat> so we can produce, we could produce, as I said, biofungents. The, bio, the amount of biofungents, of course, is extremely weak, okay? Uh, is 10 to the 20 times less than water. That's why we need really uh, a, a big laser. And uh, so, anyway, but of course, uh, if I'm coming back to my curve here, and we have, <clears throat> we're looking at the intensities as a function of, of, of years, and we say that now what we would like, we will be able to reach this point, but really, where well, things are going to be exciting for fundamental physics will be in, in this regime, okay? And, uh, and, and that will be uh, this, this is where I say this is a really t tall order. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, this is where we have to be, uh, in the regime we're first going to observe vacuum polarizations, and then at the end we will observe, I mean, or we will start to observe the breakdown, the vacuum breakdowns, okay? In fact, it was very funny because uh, our chairman said, you know, with lasers, thinking about biology, what we'd be able like, to produce, with this high-intensity laser, we'd be able to produce very, very small hole in a membrane, things like that. But here, the holes are going to be made in vacuum, okay, which is very difficult to make. Uh, but you have to be in this regime and, uh, and, and to observe pairs. Uh, so um, <clears throat> now, of course, we may not have right now <coughs> the field, you know, because we need to have this uh, zeta watt and so on uh, uh, power, but we can do, we can combine in order to, 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 uh, to produce pairs, we can combine the UV or the gamma rays or X-ray that we are able to produce, as I said, you know, very, very um, uh, in great synchronism with, uh, with, with the laser. We can combine it with the, with, with the field of the laser, and then we can, we, we can, we can really uh, uh, produce pair these ways. So, I mean, we have, we have tricks to, to, to do it very much like we did, you know, uh, in bound electron nonlinear optics, you know, uh, when we are measuring the care effect and so on. We are going to use the same techniques. Okay, and we need, uh, of course, a very high intensity lasers. Now, uh, uh, and uh, very quickly, because uh, there are basically three ways to, 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 uh, to, um, to get high intensity laser, can get high peak power. That's for the first the CPA uh, and um, OPCPA. <coughs> a new technique which is uh, called backward Riemann amplification, where we are using the Riemann effect in plasmas to compress the pulse. Now, the two first techniques, you know, require gratings. And we cannot use gratings now for, for what we want to do. If you want to go to the beyond the exawatt, we won't be able to, to use gratings. The grading will have to be huge, okay, because the damage threshold of grading is in 100 millijoules per square centimeters. Now, if you are able to do thing, these kind of things with Raman, then the, 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 damage, the damage threshold will, we cannot talk too much about damage threshold with plasmas, but um, with plasmas, we could be able to improve things by a factor of 1,000 to 10,000 times. So we can reduce the size of beams by 1,000, 10,000 times. 
And, and so that will be uh, uh, one way, and this is something that we are trying to, uh, to do. This is quickly the technique of uh, backward Raman amplifications where we have a, a pump pulse, you know, uh, forming, forming the plasmas, and, and then we uh, uh, counter-propagating is a seed <coughs> pulse, and the pump pulse at different wavelengths, uh, and the seed pulse and the pump pulse bit. Uh, uh, the bit frequency corresponds to the plasma frequencies. And so uh, what happened, okay, is you have the pump, the pump pulse, is, the energy of the pump pulse is transferred to the seed pulse. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that is what we would like to do. And uh, it could be efficient. And we need that. We need absolutely, uh, and this is the type of thing that we, is going to be done here with Dino and, and so on. Okay. Um, so, uh, and this I'm going, this I call that C cube for cascaded compression conversion, C cube. I'm not going too much in detail now. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, hopefully, if we do all this well, maybe after 10 years or so, we will be able to use the photons really uh, to do really fundamental research. I think, uh, of course, uh, you know, it's going to be a new paradigm. I think the existing paradigms, you know, based on, on, on particles, you know, is all very, still very, very strong. And, but I think the two, the two really can work in, in unison. Uh, I'm going to skip that, and this is, uh, these uh, really are some of the folks, you know, involved in, um, in, in, in all, uh, in this, we have Tad uh, Toshi here, and Bulanov, and Sokolov, and Giz, and Normava, and Natfish, and not going to, but, you know, I think we have a really a fantastic team. These are just a few of uh, the people involved. Um, so uh, we are very excited, and uh, and this is what we are trying to get, you know, and trying to go to go to uh, the top, and the top for the time being for us is going to be the 100 GeV. Okay, so thank you very much. The situation, ladies and gentlemen, is now that after this splendid presentation by uh, our guest speaker tonight, Professor Moho, there's now an opportunity to ask questions. Um, there are two roving microphones by the ladies at either side of the hall, so if you do have a question, uh, take your time to ask it, but don't give us a lecture, just ask a question. <laughs> Who would like to ask a question? Yes, down here at the front. Yeah. Thank you very much for such an excellent talk. Okay. I've got two questions. Okay. One is, uh, you know, the, I like the idea of this studying the dark matter. And can you a little bit expand on this? Or okay, these are very, very. Your question is simple, but uh, you know, I'm not really. Uh, uh, you know, high energy physicist or particle physicist and so on, I cannot really uh, explain it to except that, I mean, we are working with friends with they know that by, you know, inside out. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, uh, um, I think uh, what I, 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 as I said in the lectures, uh, what we know about what we know about um, quantum vacuum is is a quantum vacuum a low field, low signal, and and the prospect really to know local uh, uh, quantum vacuum at the at, at higher I, I field, strong field quantum vacuum. 
This, I think, leads to something, to some um, uh, uh, new discovery, because um, the model, which is really laid out by Euler and, and, and Eisenberg, you know, it's very, very, very crude, very simple. And, uh, and, and naturally, we think about if, if, we, if, for instance, we don't find what we expect to find, which is, you know, very, very precise, and this, and this is of refractions, then maybe uh, dark matters and so on would be a candidate to explain that. But I, 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 frankly, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, don't uh, I don't want to venture myself in trying to explain. But I don't know, maybe Dino knows better. Uh, I'm not sure but if he's here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a yeah, second, second question. question. Put your microphone. Uh, microphone. All, all the laser, all the terawatts laser these days are based on solid state lasers, solid mm -hmm. state devices. Yeah. Do you see a role of fiber lasers in the future? Fiber. Fiber lasers. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'm pushing. You know, I've been pushing a, a scheme which was, uh, which was not quite described this this afternoon, but uh, it was. Uh, uh, where we will use uh, fibers. And the reason is because when you are in this game of high energy particles, one thing which is really a premium is efficiency. Now, the lasers that we have are really percent efficiency. Some are fraction of a percent efficiency. Um, and we need to go uh, if you want really to do high energy physics with, you know, because, you know, the power involves, you know, are enormous. You know, they are absolutely enormous. I mean, you are talking about gigawatt, well, fraction of gigawatt. Not peak power, <laughs> but uh, uh, CW power. So we have to produce that with absolutely pristine efficiency. Uh, like uh, 40, 50 percent efficiency. And uh, for me, there's only one way uh, to do it, is certainly fibers, because you can, uh, you have a chance, I think, you have a fighting chance to, uh, to produce uh, this, uh, this efficiency. This is uh, number one. I mean, this is uh, this what we have to think when we design our systems. Now we don't care about the efficiency of what we are doing when we are doing basic science. I mean, it can be, <coughs> now it's dismal, you know. But uh, when we will do uh, fundamental science, um, like colliders and so on, I mean, we will have to have high efficiencies and then I think fibers as a very as, as a very good um, good candidate, but you will have to face millions of fibers. Doesn't mean that we have to face million fiber at the same time, because we will have several stages, maybe hundred stages. So, but you have you are going to have maybe ten ten thousand times fiber. Now we have been able to phase 64 fibers, quite easily, in fact, together. And, uh, and I think thousand fiber is going to be relatively easy after some time. So I think we are, we are close to the 10,000. If we can do 10,000, then we can, we can make 100 times 10,000. And we are, we, are, we are in the game. Another question? Yes, there's a. So, thank you again for the nice talk. But my question is when you move to this high power level, is it material what you have at the moment so, satisfy you? <clears throat> well, because when you need to amplify this high level. That's right. And that's the reason why we are moving toward plasma compressions. Uh, you see, uh, until now, uh, we can we can really um, use a, you know um, uh, known technology I would say to the hundred petawatt systems, F few hundred petawatts. Okay, it's stretching, but we can we can still do that. We have to use uh, 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 you know gratings, 
if we do some uh, improvement on the, the, the grading is, 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 a, is a weak link. You know, the diffraction grading is really the weak link, okay? With 100 millijoule or so, millijoule per square centimeters. Uh, that, you know, if you want really to compress a few kilojoule process, you, you divide and you will see that there are big, big readings. Now, that's the reason why we want really to study the possibility of doing that with Raman, Raman compression or Brewen compression, Raman. Um, plasma means plasma compression, okay? And, um, uh, and, and then you are moving from the 100 millijoule to the joule level. Uh, and this, uh, and um, so, uh, so this is, this is the gist of what we would like right to do. Okay, uh, but you are right. Right now, we are really we have reached a limit where uh, the size of the amplifier are so s uh, such that we cannot really. Uh, typically, you are talking about uh, joules per square centimeter. Typical size. We like to get into kilojoule per square centimeter with plasma compression. Thank you. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Uh, it's about the relationship between the short time and the high power and, uh, and the converse. If you've got high yeah. power, you get short time. That's right. Now, I'm a signal processor. I deal with time and frequency. And if you know one quite well, you don't know the other quite so well. There's, it's kind of like the uncertainty principle. So uh, I'm wondering how this works. Actually. Well, I mean, uh, don't forget this. We are an extreme nonlinear regime. I mean... We are talking about nonlinear effect, right? And this is so. There's no rela direct relationship with apparently, you know. But uh, 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 but I, w I was. I mean, what's what's was something from the early days? Mm -hmm. You know, I always was. You know, if you are looking at uh, Q switch, mod locking, mm -hmm. and so on. You know, every time we had to. And you increase the intensities. You increase yeah. the intensity yeah. in order to get shorter pulses. Yeah, that's right. Every time. And um, so uh, then we, um, uh, we um, uh, you know, I, I wanted to show it at one point. So uh, then uh, we, we started and we published this Nature, uh, this nature um, article uh, last year, January last year, uh, science, I'm sorry, science article, and where we, we plotted all the pulse durations and all the intensities, you know, that, that, that was that used to produce it. And we had this very nice, nice, um, nice linear relationship. Now, people have, have shown, in fact, it's not a conjecture, that was like a conjecture. Now it's a theorem, because it has been shown uh, uh, with uh, free electron lasers. Uh, so it's not a conjecture anymore. It's, it's, so there really, if, if, if really you want to have short, short pulses, you need first to work on your laser to get higher intensity. And everybody which is in this business of short pulses, you know, understand when, when I, I talk uh, because, uh, you know, this is the uh, way. So, but, and, and this is it's a, very, it's a very nice guide because if we want really to go into uh, zeptoseconds and so on, we know roughly what we are going to need. We, are, we don't know exactly the techniques, but we are going to, uh, what we will come up with, but at least we will need some intensities in order to get, let's say, in a zeptosecond regime, you know, single zeptosecond regime or something. Yeah. Yes, at the very back. I enjoy your talk very much. Um, I wonder, would you comment on the topic of laser fusion, which is obviously quite relevant to many of the technologies that you've done, and is very topical given the work at Lawrence Livermore and also the LMJ project in France? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thierry, you, you want to mention something? You want to say something? <laughs> um, of course, uh, laser fusion is something which, you know, is typically the, um, the intensities you are talking about in laser fusion is 10 to the 15 watts per square centimeters or about. Uh, 
And what we have been talking here is 10 to the, over 10 to the 25 watt per square centimeters. So, uh, you know, they don't really, uh, uh, they don't play a role. That being said, you can use very, very short pulses to ignite, uh, to cool ignite. In fact, with these very, very high intensity pulses, these very high intensity pulses, uh, because of uh, the plasma frequency, now you are lowering the plasma frequency so much. But something which is very, uh, very um, opaque could really become transparent. And uh, I'm talking about, you know, when uh, it, it, we, are, we, were, we have been, we had, we had a, what we call ISEST uh, workshop two days in November. And uh, Pukov, Sasha Pukov, came up with a concept uh, where you could really use these very high intensities to go really, really uh, easily for the plasma. You know, when you are really shining the laser on the pellet, you are producing, of course, this plasma, and this plasma screening, you know, uh, all the light, prevents the light to come up. So, but if now this is not true, if you have very high, ultra high intensity lasers, you could really go very deep. And here, the light, I mean, all this, this, this kilojoule or so will be trapped, basically. And nothing will come up. So, so, there, so what I'm saying is, uh, there is not a, a direct relevance to the type of physics I was talking about, but we could use, this is part of the application, in fact. We could use these very, high, very, very short pulses and use them as a new way, really, to do uh, laser fusion. Could be a new, new paradigm, new, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Um, speaking about um, eliciting a nonlinear response from the vacuum, um, if the vacuum's everywhere, the vacuum's in in the jug of water in front of you. It will be in the fibre that you use to generate uh, the pulse. The so vacuums. How will how will you be able to separate? The nonlinear response in the sample from the thing you yeah. use to, no. to this test. Is, this is very, very good questions. Okay, and uh, it turns out uh, it's, it's, the technology is there. Okay, technology is there. There's no question about it. Okay, we can go and we can create vacuums. You know, with um, I'm talking about pneumatic vacuum. Okay, now uh, with I don't know with. Uh, uh, few particles per cubic centimeters. Okay. Um, now, of course, you uh, um, you and and um, few particles per cubic centimeters. So, uh, and you are going to focus the beams over micrometers. Okay. So, of course, a chance to have these few particles, you know, in the, in the confocal parameters of your beam is very unlikely. But the problem is, of course, you have this Rayleigh range, this Rayleigh range where uh, uh, you have to, to go quite far before you are, really, uh, you are below uh, the ionization threshold of your materials. Uh, but it's, it's, it's absolutely doable. Uh, it's going to be expensive, but I mean, but the technology is there. But it's a very good question, of course. We, uh, we, yeah. I think that's an excellent question to finish with, <laughs> and I think the President will now close the. Well, um, you have to remember, Professor Miro, that I am a microbiologist, so I think you left me quite far behind early on. But um, 
I, I have been just totally amazed by your presentation. Um, for one thing, I think starting from the very beginning, describing the 50 years and the pace of change that has taken place in the 50 years since the introduction of the laser um, is just uh, remarkable. And also there's a supreme confidence that you know what is going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. I mean, your graphs are um, very convincing to a <laughs> Um So it's a fascinating setting. And within that, it, se it seemed to me you were talking about uh, various really fundamental components, electrons and photons, um, the quantum vacuum, uh, very high voltage, very high intensity laser amplification, generation of plasmas, compression, and all of that has phenomenal impact on the energy that you create in the system. So what it left me thinking about was um, how do we harness and control these forces into the future and how best can we use them? And how best do we formulate and describe the paradigm to predict the future? But I think you and your colleagues demonstrate a real confidence that we're going to be able to do that. And I think that demonstrates really a most encouraging background to an incredible fusion of mathematics and physics. Thank you for an amazing lecture. Thank you.